Welcome back, Wargamers, as we continue our exploration of the Ogre Ma tribes. Now, previously in this series, we've discussed the, the Gut Busters and the Beast Claw Raiders, right? These two distinct but forever intertwined cultures in the greater Ogre race. And while those videos focused on the lore of them individually, today I want to step back and talk about how they function kind of on the macro level, right? From the bird's eye view. Because as I mentioned, hopefully in both those videos and made very clear, it's not all gut busters or all beast claw raiders within a maw tribe. It certainly can be if that's what you'd like, but many of them, I would dare say most of them are intermingled. The reason being, this is a race that instinctually understands that might makes right. When a bunch of gut busters meets a tribe that is predominantly beast claw raiders, they fight over resources and also to assert dominance. The victor will absorb the surviving ogres from the other army, and all of a sudden you get these really, really big maw tribes that are a great mix of Beast Claw Raider units as well as gut busters. In this way, Alfrostans have like, you know, large herds of Beast Claw Raiders, but there's a few gut busters with them, or war gluts that have several Beast Claw Raider units. No matter the composition of these units, all that matters is that everyone acknowledges a single leader and that that leader is constantly guiding them towards their next meal. And that's how a stable Ma tribe can exist with this mix of units and things like that. And these Ma tribes exist all over the mortal realms. They're all highly nomadic, right? Moving into ever expanding hunting grounds, there's a ton of freedom to design a very personalized Ma tribe to fit whatever collection you own or want to own. That being said, Games Workshop gives us six distinct great Ma tribes. These are the ones that stand out, right? Tribes so widely renowned for their power and their hunger and the devastation that they cause. And we're going to be exploring them all right now. Keep in mind, these are colossal groups. Any one of them can really honestly muster any unit that you want just due to their sheer size. So even within these specific Ma tribes, they might focus on a particular type of unit leaning towards um, gut busters are leaning towards Beast Claw Raider, but they can because of the nature of how large they are and how many other Maw tribes they've conquered and absorbed can field whatever they want. First up is the Meat Fist Maw Tribe, and this is likely the most successful Maw Tribe there is. Their hunting ground seems to be the largest in the realms, which is kind of a testament to how long they've been around as a coherent force, right? Remember I said they keep making these concentric rings that get bigger and bigger as they keep hunting more and more places. Well, that's a testament to how long they've been going is just the size of their hunting ground. And their home of the, it's called the Great Gut Fort, seems to be without equal. They boast the most ogres of any Maw tribe in the realms. And this has led them to massive success because now they can absorb other Wargluts and Alfrostans regularly. Only like fueling the inertia, right, of this army further. They are distinguished by the bloody red stained hand that they all bear. And this is a symbolic gesture, hearkening back to the Ma tribe's first over tyrant, the guy who was in charge of all of the different war gluts. His name was Grawl Meatfist, who defeated a colossal creature called a Titanox. And the way he killed it was he stabbed the beast with one hand, right, just straight up through the thing's uh, hide, and then tore out its insides. And so that gesture of the red hand, which tore the beast's heart out, is what they try to emulate. Grawl was said to be stronger than any other ogre, and the Meat Fists believe that his bloodline continues in them. Now, they are not silent about this grandiose origin story and how they think that they are, you know, lineage-wise related to a great ogre, becoming one of the most boastful and arrogant Ma tribes out there. To the point where other Ma tribes get pretty agitated by them, right? You get tired of the guy who's constantly boasting about how great he is. Currently, their over-tyrant is Glob Glitter Maw, a cunning ogre who leads the tribe in a very unique way. You see, typically, ogres eat everything. It's kind of been a theme we've been talking about all week, right? But they'll eat jewels, gems, precious metals, anything like that. But Glob has corralled his followers to store some of the shinier things and actually conducts trade with other cultures. 
And here's the thing, we don't normally think of commerce as a weapon, right? But it is a deadly new skill for this race. And with that wealth, Glob has secured weapons, black powder, food, and more. He hosts these grandiose feasts, and he's always looking to outdo himself. Every party and celebration and meal has to be bigger than the last. But that cunning of, of using resources in a different way rather than just eating everything, that kind of, I guess we would call it like a vision for what could be versus what's right in front of you, is really, really entertaining. And while they have a lot of enemies, particularly the Stormcast Eternals, Chaos, and other Ma tribes, the Meat Fists only perceive these threats as like a smorgasbord of food coming towards them. Our next Ma tribe hails from the realm of Akshi, it's fire, and these are the Blood Gullets. Boasting more butchers and slaughter masters than any other Ma tribe, they have become masters of the blood magics and divination available to them. Think of them as like the wizard magic prayer focused Ma tribe, if you will. From them, the power and spirit of Gorkamorka is in the blood. That's their belief. Everything centers around blood. So while all Ma tribes see uh, food and the act of consuming it to be the end goal, the blood gullet has an added edge that it's the blood of the realms that Gorkamorka seeks. Cooking meat to them is just super evil, right? It's disgraceful. It sullies everything, putting them at odds with the fire bellies, right? Shamans who use fire to burn their victims. Their method of warfare involves a lot of hacking and slashing, spilling as much blood as possible, being sure to drink every drop that they can. There's even a story about how like you'll he'll hit, say for example, like a free guild soldier in the neck, and then the ogre will stop fighting, pick that guy up, and just literally drink out of him, almost like a vampire, but it's a huge, massive, gaping wound, just to make sure not a drop is lost. Before any battle, the Maw Pot is filled with boiling blood from their last trophies, and the butchers then bless this blood, kind of imbuing it with this dark, arcane power, and sprinkle it upon all of the ogre warriors. It reddens their skin, bulks them up with this extreme power and resilience, and they go out and get some more blood. Now, of course, there are a few dots here that savvy viewers can connect. We're in Akshi, Realm of Fire, and we have people who love blood. So the natural question to me was, how do they fit in with corn? Well, I'll tell you, that's actually part of their lore. One thing this book has driven home for me is the fact that ogres are not strictly hostile with other races. The Blood Gullet Ma tribe has worked alongside corn armies numerous times. In fact, Corgus Cull, Mighty Lord of Corn, who was kind of like the, the you know the picture perfect corn leader during the Realm Gate Wars, is said to have a butcher on his council named Horg Blacktooth. And I thought that was fantastic. Next up are the Underguts Ma tribe, and I really like the origin story for this one because it it fits them squarely within the greater Age of Sigmar timeline, so let's get into it. The Underguts hail from Olgu, Realm of Shadow. It's a land of darkness, fog, deception, very um, dangerous landscapes to try and navigate. Living in that environment are all kinds of shifty creatures, right? Hunting among the shadows, using, using venoms and toxins and traps to ensnare their prey. There was also a great big maw tribe of ogres. Because their diet consisted of all these venomous and dangerous creatures and the lack of sunlight, their skin took on this sickly green hue. And they've been in Olgu as far back as the Age of Myth, carving a life out for themselves in this incredibly harsh environment. But it's harsh in a different way than like, you know, the Everwinter or something like that. It's just a very unique thing that we know about in Olgu. But the Undergut story, as we know them, starts during the Age of Chaos. And to properly explain this, we need to kind of go on a little side story. As we explored in the Cities of Sigmar series, the dispossessed were rocked particularly hard by the coming of chaos. Many rune lords thought everything would blow over, right? All we'll do is we'll just batten down the hatches, fortify our homes, and brace ourselves for war. One of those such empires was Kazakh Fulgar, located in Ulgu as well. They were masters of gunpowder weapons. They made this unique blend of environmental specific ingredients to have the most potent gunpowder and in massive reserves laying around. 
They had guns for days and thought themselves safe from the ravages of chaos. However, they did not account for the other predators in the realms. It's not all chaos during the Age of Chaos. The ogres here saw the gun fort of Kazakh Fulgar and marveled at the sight and sound of their gunpowder weapons. The ogres wanted that for entertainment as much as utility. And so the Ma tribe descended upon the Duarden fortress, wiping them out to a man. They put the Noblars with them to work, designing a crude copy of their famous gunpowder. The Ma tribe then ripped the cannons from the fortress wall and stockpiled obscene amounts of ammunition, gunpowder, and weapons. Now this move did two things. It gave them a staggering number of lead belchers and iron blasters, right? Using all the cannons they just pilfered and all the gunpowder they have. And we'll explore those units a bit more in depth later. But in short, just a lot of guns. Guns for days. And it also gave them, secondly, a unique way to hunt. Other Ma tribes do that circular loop we were talking about and go back to their home base. The Underbelly started to do this, renaming Kazakh Fulgar as Mount Bello, but they soon realized there was another way to hunt that they now had access to. With the gunpowder in their possession, they could blast their way around Ulgu, carving these deep tunnels, allowing them to ambush prey or get around defenses. So all of a sudden, they come across a civilization that's, you know, well defended behind their big sturdy walls, well, those walls turn into, you know, the rim of a buffet table all of a sudden when ogres pour out from inside the fortress because they tunneled their way underneath. In addition to that, they are also known to work with the Gloomspite Gits. Both societies prefer to shroud themselves in darkness. Uh, the ogres, specifically these ones in Olgu, like to join them in nighttime raids. So I like that story quite a bit because I feel like it gives them the most context in terms of keeping them relevant to, like the main timeline of what's going on, I thought that was a great touch. Next up, we're talking about the Boulderhead Ma tribe. Led by the Frost King Bragath Vardruk, the ogres of the Boulderhead are some of the most fearsome and resilient ogres within the realms. They call themselves the Sfjard, old beast claw raider tongue for unbreakable ones. They see themselves as the rightful heirs and kings of the ogre race, seeking to dominate all of their other kin. They have a deep focus on martial prowess and pride themselves on how many mounts they have in their army, meaning like all the different thunder tusks and stone horns and that kind of thing. And they have bred these beasts into being some of the toughest in the realms. It actually describes this really cool bonding ritual. And I, I'm always really curious whenever Games Workshop takes time to say like how rider and mount kind of like work together. Because a lot of times in these books, they seem to be like on the same page, even though one's an animal, one's theoretically smarter than an animal. Um, but this one is really, really interesting to me. Let's take, for example, a Mornfang cavalry, right? You have an ogre and you have the Mornfang beast itself. Uh, the ogre will take a knife, cut a part, uh, just a huge sliver, right, of his own fat off of his body. Now, they're super fat, they're super thick, very tough, this doesn't hurt them that much. And they feed it to the Mornfang. And then they walk over to the Mornfang and cut a huge hunk of them, and they, as the ogre, eat that. So, they exchange each other's flesh, basically, to bond them to their mounts. And this connection allows the mount to basically, it's like a weird trust thing, right? Like, I know you're not going to hurt me. You've eaten my flesh. You're not going to turn around and hit me and eat me some night. Um, all of a sudden, the mount will trust the rider instinctively and just ride straight into cannon fire, whatever. There's no fear. It just does whatever the ogre tells it to do. To further add to their destruction, the ogres in this Ma tribe regularly, with a disciplined nature, eat rocks and steel. See, ogres are very much, they are what they eat, right? And this toughens up their skin to the point where there's this myth and this rumor that they can headbutt a cannonball out of the sky, which is the coolest sounding thing I think I've ever heard from this battle tome. Like I said, a big focus here, uh, other than food and dominance, is to unify the ogres under their command. While they think they're, like, they think generally very little of gut busters, they have conquered many war gluts, so the numbers are swelling up, right? The, the leader there, he knows you have to have numbers if you're going to go against some of these other larger Ma tribes, so he tolerates them being around. 
Continually, however, they are denied their goals. Because other Ma tribes are so scornful and distrusting of the Boulderhead, they'll work together to fight them away, right? And, and a level of teamwork means a great deal in this army where they just generally absorb each other. And But the fact that two tribes are like, this third guy is such a jerk. Let's just work together and get rid of him. And that's exactly what's happening is the Boulderhead can't assert their dominance because everybody else hates them so much for trying to do so, they keep getting pushed back. They are like these elite outcasts of the Maw tribes, seeing themselves as rightful rulers and using a combination of deadly mounts and tough ogres to win the day. Next on our list here are the Thunderbellies. This is an example of uh, environments of the realms affecting ogres and how that looks when you throw in the Everwinter. Described as a young tribe relative to others, uh, the Thunderbellies come out of Chamon, Realm of Metal, making their home on a series of what's called Sky Roads. Think of these as colossal pathways that traverse the very like scattered and disparate parts of Chamon. The alchemical instability of the realm and the Everwinter have kind of warped together almost. The mounts of this Ma tribe, particularly the Mornfang, have been imbued with the power of the storm, giving off this electric shimmer of light as they run. And this is what happens when a lightning storm fuses with the Everwinter. Because of the saturation of magic on the Sky Roads, their husk guards and their butchers and particularly adept at channeling magics and the raw power of this storm. Now, I'll be honest, there's not a ton of lore for this one, uh, but there are a few things that I wanted to point out in, in specific. One of their favorite pastimes, almost like a rite of passage, is trying to eat lightning, much in the same way as that you and I, like when it's the first snow of the year, we'll go outside and like stick our tongues out and try to get a snowflake on our tongue. Same thing, except they're trying to catch lightning bolts. And for some of the ogres, they're not quote unquote worthy and they get fried instantly and killed, but for many of them, they can take the punishment. And so it's a fun little game they play. The book also says they only speak at a deafening bellow. And that's partially because they're so used to their voices competing with the wind and the thunder that they're constantly yelling at each other. And that's just how they are used to talking now. And the last part of this lore section I thought was particularly interesting. So since they can eat lightning, they've developed a taste for what they call lightning meat. And what lightning meat is, it's the arc of energy that fires into the sky when a storm cast eternal dies. And in fact, many chambers are reporting that storm cast eternals are not being reforged. And that is a huge deal. The last bit is that their position on these sky roads allows them the constant movement that they need to stay ahead of the Everwinter. Access to Chaman's storm magics or a fresh supply of prey because everybody wants to control the Sky Road. It's just, it's a great tactical important place. However, the shift to these higher areas and a focus on the storm constantly puts them at odds with the Beasts of Chaos. That's kind of like their boogeyman because the Dragon Ogre Shaggoths, if you remember that lore video, are up in the high peaks and they are basically beasts born of the storm. They love um, the lightning and the storms and all that kind of stuff like that. And so they're competing constantly with their magics and who has supremacy over that part. And the last of the great Ma tribes is also one of the more mysterious ones. And that is the Winterbite Ma tribe. Hailing from Gur's tundra regions, their adaptation is a bit different. Instead of a thunderous charge or a full frontal assault, Instead, you are surrounded by a thick, freezing fog. And slowly, the people in your army get picked away by these shadowy figures, and all you hear is screaming, but you can't see anything because of the, like, isolating, thick fog. There's zero visibility. And it's only when you are scared and disorganized does the hammer descend with the beasts of stark white fur charging into your lines. What makes the Winter Maw unique above all is that their relationship to the Everwinter. We see whenever the Everwinter is discussed, despite not being like fully explained, it's always mentioned that some see it as a blessing and some see it as a curse. The thing is, we don't really see the ogres who view it as a blessing until this book. The ogres here see the Everwinter that surrounds them 
as the breath itself of Gorka Morka, the divine gift that allows them to hunt and stalk the realms without equal. To maximize this gift, the ogres wear white pelts and they breed their beast to an ivory white fur, and all of this acts as the perfect camouflage within the Everwinter's grasps. And it makes them extremely unique because when I say camouflage, right, like subtlety is not a dominant feature in this faction if you haven't picked up on it this week so far. But as mentioned yesterday, the best beast claw raider maw tribes have adapted to this environment that they carry with them. And I don't think anyone else has done it as well as these. Their reverence for this fog and everwinter goes super far. Um, they'll leave victims, sometimes alive, for the storm to consume, which doesn't sound like a big deal until you consider the lengths that ogres go for food. They take this worship and their gratitude for the Everwinter very, very seriously. And I actually really like that this Ma tribe, because it offers something different, like a totally unique spin uh, than the other Ma tribes, and I love it for that. Now, why are all of these great Ma tribes really cool? And I won't spend a ton of time here because they all have their own reasons for why they're really cool. But I like seeing how each Ma tribe has evolved to its environment, but also to other Ma tribes and societies. Working with others, trying to conquer other Ma tribes, uh, living in a storm, in the fog, shadow, caves. It's a very adaptable race, and it's likely what allowed them to survive the Age of Chaos. Most of the lore sections here each have at least alluded to the various types of ogres being combined. Like, the Beast Claw Raider focused ones mentioned having gut busters with them, which I feel is important because I think a lot of the rest of this book lacks that, right? It feels like two armies were put together and there's just no reason you can't combine them, which is not the same thing as saying this is now a narratively combined force. As for my favorite of them, I have to say Winter Bite at the end there. They are clearly the most unique spin on a Maw Tribe, I think personally. I like that they, div they kind of view the Everwinter as this divine blessing without question, right? It is a definite good thing. All thumbs up. They embrace it and they use it as the weapon it is instead of carrying it like a curse. Plus, I like that they have hunters and yetis and it all seems very fun to paint. So tell me in the comments down below what is your favorite of the Great Ma Tribes. I'm super curious because tell me why. I think that's really awesome to hear. And I look forward to seeing you in my next video. Thank you for watching. And happy wargaming.